cycle. So we're going to get started here. Uh, and just to mention, this is the first of a series of 10 uh, webinars that the University of Illinois uh, Extension Small Farms Local Food Team will be teaching. Uh, most of you probably registered for the entire series, so you know the dates and times, and, and you're all set to go with them. But the way we come up with these topics is when we hear from you growers out there of things that you're facing or ideas or things you want more continuing education on, we put that together in this web series so that we can uh, kind of broaden our outreach to the uh, uh, all the small growers here in the state of Illinois. And we've actually got a lot of growers uh, joining in from Missouri and around the country here today too. So, okay, so my topic today is uh, raising broiler turkeys on small farms. I want to give a little bit of explanation uh, about myself. Uh, I've been with Extension for about 18 years now, and uh, I'm a small farms local food educator based out of Galesburg, and I have four counties in western Illinois. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with growers, and I am a grower myself, both in terms of uh, vegetable crops, and I do raise uh, uh, mostly pastured uh, broiler chickens, but I have raised broiler turkeys also. So that's kind of a background on me, and as we talk today, uh, at times I will have my extension educator hat on, and other times I will have uh, a producer hat on, and I hope that's useful for you uh, uh, because I've learned uh, as much or more from all of the great growers that I have out there than than what I've ever brought to their farm, and that's a, I mean that to be a very much a compliment to them. So let's get going here today. Um, so we're going to talk about raising broiler turkeys on small farms, and I want everyone to also um, think about um, the perspective that I'm going to speak from is definitely from a small farm perspective. Uh, I won't talk really uh, in, in terms of large commercial houses or anything like that because it's a different environment uh, uh, literally that, that these turkeys grow in. So I'm going to speak a lot towards the small farm uh, portion of this. So let's get going here today. Um, Turkey, uh, you know, average consumer eats about 17 pounds of turkey, and usually that, you know, the bulk of that happens here uh, during the holidays. And uh, I know a lot of the uh, um, uh, associations are trying to get people to eat more uh, turkey throughout the year, and um, but the bulk of the sales are still during the Christmas holidays. Um, you'll find that uh, some of the other products, the value-added products that come from turkeys, are um, consumed more readily throughout the year. But um, you know, 17 pounds of, of, of turkey, you know, in a year, that's a, that's a real market that's out there for us to consider. Okay. All right. Um, so turkeys, you know, if turkeys aren't a, aren't a new thing out there, turkeys on small farms were very commonplace as well as you know all the other poultry, uh, you know, in the uh, early part of the last century up through the early part of uh, last century, about through World War II. Um, not only you know did the did the producers on the farm use them for their own consumption, but they were a commodity that was marketed out there. Uh, so the small f or turkeys on on farms have been around for a long time. And what's really interesting about my job when I work with growers now, and we look about small farm production practices with poultry, is a lot of the things that growers were using and doing you know, back in the early part of the last century are the same thing that small producers now uh, need to be thinking about, even in terms of equipment and housing and uh, things like that. So, you know, it's very interesting that uh, uh, things from the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you know, we're, we're looking at as contemporary uh, approaches to raising poultry even today. Okay, this is another picture uh, of uh, 1940. Basically, it's a shelter for pasture range turkeys. Um, so, uh, like I said, they've been around there a long time. And uh, the nice thing about a lot of these things, especially with equipment, is uh, a lot of the equipment that we might consider using now, back from the, that era, that was kind of tried and true. They didn't use something that didn't work very well. So, there's just a picture of a, uh, a uh, shelter out there from the 40s. And that's another one. Uh, this shelter is on skids, so it could be moved around, and that's very much the same type of approach many of the growers uh, today are using. 
So let, let's do some quick definitions here as we go. Um, you'll hear the term standard bread, but let's let's kind of start the basics here, you know, and go through the some definitions. So we, you'll hear the term standard bread, and what that means is basically that's a naturally mating turkey. Uh, it has a long productive lifespan and slower growth. Those are the kind of the three criteria when you hear standard bread, and and these types of turkeys are are uh, 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 that we raise on some, uh, small farms are. are most of the growers that I work with are raising a, a breed of standard bred turkey. Uh, most aren't raising actually a, a broad-breasted white uh, on farm uh, because they, um, the difference, not because, but the difference there is, you know, they're not naturally mating and they're, they don't have a really uh, long life and, and uh, if you've raised uh, uh, some of the Cornish rock, for instance, chicken broilers, you know, they just grow differently and, and may or may not thrive in the environment that we have on a small farm. But for just to go forward, the standard bred turkeys are naturally mating, they, live, they can live a long time, and they have a slower growth uh, rate out there. Okay. So in the commercial industry, uh, you know the most widely used uh, bird is the broad-breasted white, and, and you know why are they why are they using that that bird? As you can see from the graph at the bottom of the page here, you know it doesn't take very long for these birds you know to get to market. So when you're in a a large commercial setting like that, and, and you're wanting to turn over what they call turn over your your facility, get as many birds as you can through there in a year, you know, a 40% reduction in days to market, that's going to that's gonna appeal to you. Now, the type of, the breed that you choose is going to be very much up to you. There's good and bad aspects to all of the breeds out there, and the decision of what one to use is going to be based on, you know, some of the specific criteria for your farm. So, you will never hear me or my colleagues, you know, suggesting that you should raise this bird or that bird. Uh, and, until we have an idea of what your what your environment is on your farm. Okay. Now, uh, as I said earlier, I'm speaking uh, much uh, from the from the aspect of, of working with small growers and what I say in terms of turkeys with small growers. Uh, a lot of the the growers that I work with are, are feeding you know like un, well under 50 birds. Uh, so they are small, and uh, most that I work with, not all of them, and certainly there are growers all over that aren't raising these, but midget white turkeys are ones that's very, uh, very popular on small farms. And when I talk with the growers that I work with that are raising these, and this is the the breed actually that uh, um, that I've raised. Um, they're a little smaller bird than a lot of the others, so you'll end up having, you know, a, a nine or ten pound. Uh, bird for the for the consumer to buy, and um, they're very good at, at utilizing pasture systems. They're lighter weight when finished. You know, if the hopefully when you're raising these, you know, and all of the, the the really neat aspects of raising these on a small farm, you're going to be able to get a premium, you know, for these types of products. So, uh, an interesting thing that my growers note is, you know, if you are going to get a premium, um, you know, instead of the supermarket at 99 cents, you know, just pull a figure out. Say you get four dollars a pound. Well, four dollars a pound for a ten pound bird is, is much different than four dollars a pound for a twenty, twenty five pound bird. So the midget white turkey is a very uh, popular breed uh, on small farms and uh, we'll see them quite a bit. Okay. Uh, another popular one that you'll see out there, a heritage breed, uh, is the uh, Bourbon Red. Uh, they're very good uh, foragers. It's probably the second most popular uh, uh, bird that we would see on small farms. Uh, I do also have growers that are growing a, a mix of these different birds too. So Bourbon Red is another one that, that you'll find uh, very popular. Uh, the Narragansett uh, is another one out there, Calm Disposition. All, like I said, all of these have uh, very, uh, all of these have advantages and disadvantages. You just really need to do some homework when you decide what you're going to uh, uh, feed out. And the Royal Palms are, are another one out there. Um, the note on on uh, the Royal Palms, uh, I did some studying from the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy uh, Group, and they said you know the Royal Palms are very good flyers. So that's something to consider also. Okay, here's some slate and uh, bourbon uh, red toms. Just some pictures of some mature birds for you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, this is a resource. Uh, the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy uh, is basically kind of a, a, a group of people, both 
private growers and industry people, university people that are, are all working towards uh, conserving a number of heritage breeds of livestock. So um, we don't have enough time to go into a lot of the breed stuff today, but if you just search the ALBC website, uh, they have extensive uh, uh, um, profiles of all of these different types of birds uh, along with other different livestock too if you want. So that's a really good resource, the American Livestock Breed uh, Conservancy. Okay, um, like I said, I'm putting my producer hat on now, uh, and raising turkeys is different than raising chickens. Um, they're both uh, breeds of poultry, yes, but it's different. Uh, turkeys, uh, most growers would tell you, are a little more fragile bird uh, than, than, um, than what chickens are, and, and most of the time, most of the mortality that you're going to see with turkeys uh, is going to be within the uh, first two weeks of life. So if you you get the birds through that first two weeks, that critical period, um, you know you're, you're doing well. But you're going to see a little more mortality probably than chickens. Okay. Uh, and just my grower hat again. Always pay for express shipping of uh, it's not chicks, it's poults. Excuse me for that. And get them home as soon as you can. You know from the hatchery. Um, the express shipping isn't that much more, and you just get them back quicker, and um, it's just well worth it, okay? Less stress on the birds. So stress is a key thing in terms of mortality because stress reduces, you know, the resiliency of that bird to be able to uh, withstand all of the other things, okay? Um, turkeys are larger. You know, they eat more. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, you know, total amounts of food that they would eat, but... Um, if you've raised poultry before, especially broilers, by the time those broilers are getting finished, you go through a lot of feed. Well, you know, uh, consider that they're you know three times, uh, possibly four times bigger than uh, than the the uh, chickens. They're going to eat a lot of feed. Most are, some are aggressive. Most are not. Um, what I mean by that is, you can find that the the, the toms will start to get a little more aggressive, and the way that is usually remedied is um, you can raise hens and toms together. The hens basically, they're marketed at a smaller weight, so about the time that the toms kind of start to get aggressive, the hens are, are, are marketed and you've got them out of there, so uh, there's less aggression in the toms. Uh, processing, labor, and handling. Um, Processing is something you want to really consider from, uh, you know, if, if I had to give you two things to think of today after you leave, one would be, um, before you do any of this, where are you going to market the birds, okay? So you have an idea of, uh, you know, you don't want to just raise these birds, you know, for possibly five, six months and, and then not have anywhere to market them or, or even make back your costs. But the other thing, too, is how and where are you going to process them because it's much there's much more labor involved in processing these turkeys uh, than there are chickens um, so you want to look into you know if you have your own uh, uh, processing equipment do you have the right size kill cones and, and transport cages and, and things like that and then the other side is is there the, the availability of someone to be able to process that for you uh, so that's a consideration Okay, uh, storage. Um, most are sold fresh. Almost all of the growers that I work with, they have uh, two kill dates right before uh, the holidays, and uh, the birds are processed and usually delivered, you know, that very day. So uh, they're most are sold fresh. If you freeze them, you know, it takes a lot of storage, as you know, just from storing one bird uh, for the holidays. And their nutrition is different, and, and there's no surprise there. Okay. So on the management of them, we'll talk a little bit about um, some of these things, brooding, wing clipping, herding, roosting, fencing, and equipment. There's just, like I said, these are some of the differences that we would see compared to raising uh, chickens. Okay. So let's talk about um, day one uh, management of, of these uh, poults that you get. Remember the, you know, we're not talking baby chicks, the terminology here is poults. Uh, remember I said to you to pay for express shipping, it's well worth the money. Uh, you're going to get a call, uh, for those of you that are brand new, um, you have to order a minimum usually. Uh, the hatcheries won't send out, you know, one or two uh, poults, uh, just like there's a minimum number of, of baby chicks that they'll send out. And the reason they do that is because they need to be able to stay warm in the boxes in transport. So um, usually what I find uh, with a lot of the hatcheries is, you know, there's about a 10-bird minimum. I'm sure you can get some 
some fewer somewhere, um, but um, that's probably something that you should think about is, you know, how many birds you want to be feeding here for your first try. Um, so have your, have your brooder set up for 24 hours ahead of time. I'm going to talk about brooders here in a little bit. And uh, uh, now the next one is just the same with chickens. You know, they need sound footing, and uh, so make sure that you use pine, uh, pine wood shavings. Uh, the oils in the pine wood actually help with some of the molds and things like that. Don't use sawdust. That's the same as, as with the broilers. Uh, the reason is um, it's, too, it's too small. They'll get that. They'll eat that, and it'll get uh, uh, impacted in them. And then you want them right off when they get home to get uh, several things. Uh, they want a drink of water, uh, you want them to start eating, and you want them to be warm and dry. So uh, you don't want to use sawdust there, okay, pine wood shavings. Um, now, if you ask 10 growers, you'd get 11 different answers to this, you know, how do you feed the first day or so? And there's there's a lot of different ways to do it, but initially what most growers will do is they, they, they put the feed out, you know, in, in a mash form, uh, starter form on the newspaper or even in egg cartons, you know. Uh, most people actually, uh, same as chickens, will cover that, those, those wood shavings for a day with uh, some newspaper and feed on the newspaper and it seems to work well, but they don't keep that newspaper there over a day. Um, so they need, uh, another consideration is, you know, uh, the poults need space under the brooder as well as outside the brooder. So you want them to be able to go wherever they need to go um, to be comfortable. Uh, the last one is kind of a key one to me and I, I, I sometimes wonder if um, we, we don't place enough uh, importance on that, but you want to keep any disturbance, you know, to those to those birds throughout their life, but especially, you know, when they're in that brooder to a minimum. Um, you know, they, they need the rest, and boy, especially that first day when they get in there, uh, you know, they're going to stretch their legs a little bit, get a drink, they're going to find the heat, and just let them rest. So as soon as you can get them kind of processed there at home, uh, let, let them rest. And uh, I think the more time you spend with getting ready to get these um, uh, get these poults in, um, but keep keep those birds you know comfortable and, and uh, um, it's it's time well spent. The first you know three weeks probably managing your brooder are probably some of the the, the best time uh, in terms of of, of uh, the time you're going to spend with working with these birds. Okay. Uh, just with chickens, the same thing. When you get those birds home, dip their beaks in water first thing. You'll take one at, at, out at a time and dip their beak in water. And um, um, what you also want to consider, and there's not a lot of research on this, but the growers will tell you, and, and I've seen this too, that if you use a clear mason jar, a clear jar on that water, they will more uh, readily take to watering uh, because they'll associate uh, the sound of that water, what it looks like when it moves in the jar, and, and you'll really be pleased with how that'll work. So that was a trick I learned uh, from growers, and, and it works very well. Okay, brooder management. Um, these chicks need about 95 degrees, three inches off the floor um, when they first get, when you first get them on the farm, okay? Um, not, there's a lot of things here, like the decreasing five degrees each week until they're fully feathered and ready for pasture. Now, here's the difference between chickens and turkeys is, is basically, you know, these, these birds, the poults, aren't going to be fully feathered until six or eight weeks, okay? So um, with chickens, you know, they might be fully feathered at 21 days and, and you can transfer out to a, 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 your pasture system with, you know, a little bit of protection. These, these poults aren't going to be fully feathered for six or eight weeks. I'm I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you a way that that I have uh, a lot of growers using, and I use myself that kind of helps manage this. Okay. Um, for those of you that have raised chickens, would you agree with me on the next statement that you'll get so you can you can listen to those chicks and poults, and and they will tell you what they need in the brooder. And and basically, basically what they're they're saying, and I'm trying to get across is that. You'll learn the first time you won't know it, but every time you'll get better at this, you'll be able to listen to them and how they chirp and, and the sounds that they make and how they're acting in that brooder as to what their comfort level is, okay? And here's some behavior things. This is a this is a very simple schematic, but it's really important. So when you look, this is a picture like looking down at a brooder. You'll see on the left-hand side, you've got a kind of an even distribution of, of the pulse, okay, under the heat. Um, they're not all in one side. 
you know, they're not, not all in the brooder at one time, what have you. And you'll be able to read, like on the next one, that's clearly that there is a draft. On the right-hand side of this brooder, there's a draft coming in, and people, or the, the pulse, uh, are trying to get away from that draft. In the middle, there's not enough heat coming off of the brooder, so they're all snuggled up there in the middle. And then the other one on the right-hand side, you know, if they're dis uh, distributed like that, it's way too hot in there, and, and you've got some heat issues in there. Now, um, there's a lot of different brooder systems out there uh, to use. Um, this is one I'm going to show you, um, and this is, this is commonly referred to as an Ohio brooder. So if you go to any of your search engines and, and type in uh, uh, Ohio brooder um, 1942, you're going you're gonna to get a picture of this. And uh, this is just like the brooder that, that I use at home and a lot of my growers work with. The beauty of this brewer, brooder from January 1942 is it was built during uh, World War II when there were shortages on a n any number of things, you know, on the farm, especially on the farm. And so what they did was they wanted to make a, a low-cost brooder that was very heat efficient and that they could, um, you know, use over and over with, and it was constructed with uh, materials that they had on the farm. So what's so neat about this thing, and you can see on the top picture there, um, that's one of the pictures that they took where um, you see you've got birds that are kind of, you know, underneath it. Uh, there's birds on top. Now back in 1942 they said cover the top with sawdust. That's not recommended. Uh, most people will put uh, foam insulation on the top of that. And, um, but when you flip this over, this is the beauty and the simplicity of this brooder. On the bottom of the page, you can see the two heat lamps in there. And uh, uh, this is a, let me read here if I remember right, a uh, four by four, this is for chickens, so it'd be less for turkeys. A four by four would do about 200 chicks, you know, so you, you get, you know, like 75 or uh, uh, turkeys or something under that size. But so those heat lamps are turned on under there, okay? And the thing sets four inches off the floor. So when the heat lamps are turned on, I'm going to go back one, sorry about that. So when the heat lamps are turned on, those chicks self-regulate themselves. And that's the beauty of it. You know where I said that you need to reduce that five degrees each week until they're fully feathered and ready to go outside? Well, the, the poults uh, do it themselves and the chicks, if you're brooding chickens with it. If they need to get under the brooder more to get more heat, they'll do that. You know, if they need to get out, they just walk out of it. Um, but they're very good at self-regulating themselves, and what you'll find is, you know, the first uh, 10 days or so, they're going to stay pretty tight underneath that. But as they start to get, you know, their feathers on and uh, um, become more active, they'll start to move away, you know, uh, during various parts of the day to get out of that uh, brooder, but I'll tell you, that's that's just one of, probably one of the most useful things I've seen in, in the small farm poultry uh, arena in the last, you know, two years or so that I've been teaching some of this, these materials. So that's the Ohio brooder. Herding uh, turkeys, and, and if, depending on the system that you're raising them in, and you might have a day range system where you keep them locked up at night, and you let them out so they can uh, roam and, and forage in a specific area in your pasture during the day, but you'll need to be sure to get them, you know, back in uh, your whatever building or structure that you have. Um, moving them to pastures, different pastures, you may need to herd them. Um, turkeys are pretty smart, you know. Um, you can move them very easily. A lot of times they're very, very curious. A lot of times you can move them, they will follow you. Uh, where you want them to go. Um, otherwise, you know, you can just have little flags, you know, that you can wave in the air. Um, some growers have used uh, milk jugs, you know, and put them on the end of a pole and slap them on the ground, but it doesn't take much at all. Um, just a little bit of noise will make them, them move, okay? And like I said, they'll actually follow you around. Um, perches, um, if you're going to grow in um, basically some of these pasture systems, like for instance, if you're going to have a, a pasture pen where you're moving it every day, uh, most growers aren't putting perches in there. Um, the turkeys do feel, you know, a little more secure. It's a natural instinct for them, you know, at night to get up on a perch. 
uh, as the toms is noted here, as the toms get heavier, you know, they won't do that. But if you're just, in, in, you know, interested in, 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 a, in giving them perches, you can certainly do that. Uh, 15 to 30 inches off the ground, you know, about two foot apart. And uh, the 15 inches of space per bird, you know, in, in, for the for that uh, number of birds you have there is important. And another thing about you know we talk about spacing and things like that. Just make sure that that you're adhering to the to proper amount of spacing on all these because what that does is it reduces aggressive behavior. And so, for instance, you wouldn't want to build perches unless you have enough perches for uh, all of the birds, or else you're going to end up having fighting and aggression in the birds. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay, uh, fencing. Um, here's another one. If you look at ten different operations, small farm operations, uh, you'll have ten different answers to this question in terms of fencing. And for those of you that are going to use pasture uh, pens, you know where you're moving them every day, this isn't an issue. But um, you know you need to have fence at least four feet high. This is just one picture. It's a pretty nice fence. It's a permanent fence. And uh, there's not a lot of growers that are using permanent fence, but the reason I wanted to show you this picture was it's very ingenious because it has a predator guard at the base of that. So predators uh, um, basically, you know, uh, uh, the four-legged predators at least are going to have trouble getting in that pen from going underneath the fence. Um, most growers, if they're if they're day ranging, which means basically letting the the birds out of a pen so they can uh, forage all day in a pasture. If they're day ranging, they're using some sort of a a movable uh, poultry netting, electrified poultry netting, and that works you know very good. Um, but with any fencing that you use, just make sure you know it's easy to use. It's 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 portable, um, uh, durable, and you know what kind of stakes do you need uh, for this? So that, the permanent fencing picture I have there, it's it's mostly to show that predator garden. Um, not many people would have probably a permanent fence. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, this is uh, this is actually a, a quote from one of my growers. You know. Uh, the only insects that turkeys won't eat are the ones they cannot catch. And uh, if turkeys are nothing else, they're certainly uh, interesting to watch out there uh, as they forage around. So um, eating the insects, what are they going to get from that? Insects are very high in protein. So that's one of the uh, the neat aspects of raising uh, some of these animals on pasture is they get that natural uh, protein source there from the insects. I want to I want to make one comment. I'm going to go back here too. And um, you know, I said the insects are the protein. Uh, they do get some protein and other um, uh, nutrients from pasture. But there's a common misconception that pastured poultry, whether it's chickens or turkeys, get a large percent of their nutrition from the pasture. And that's actually not the case. And 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 uh, from a grower's perspective, the reason that's so important to consider is you need to make sure that you're feeding them, you know, a, a balanced. Uh, ration out there because uh, the vast majority, you know, it's hard to put a percent on this. Re they've been doing research about this, but you know, you're you're well under probably four percent or less of what their diet is is going to come from pasture sources. Um, but they do pick up very important, you know, sources of nutrition like these insects. So you still got to feed. You've got to feed them those complete balanced rations. Um, uh, when they're out there on the uh, pasture, okay. Let's keep going. Okay, um, another topic, especially for ones uh, I know we have people from all over the country listening, but I'm going to speak mostly for Illinois. Um, uh, there's a potential source, you know, to, to pasture turkey on waste grain fields here in Illinois, you know, like soybeans and, and wheat and corn and oats. Now, the only thing you need to consider there is that turkeys are very sensitive to a lot of the mycotoxins, which are basically, you know, funguses and molds, and especially aflatoxin. And, and in a certain year, and in certain parts of, of Illinois this year, we had some pretty serious aflatoxin problems. So if you think, and, and a lot of times, you know, if you're going to pasture, fall pasture some of these uh, fields like this, you know, go out there before everything is harvested and kind of see what the quality of the grain is. You can see on the bottom right-hand corner that's, that's an area that's got some issues there with uh, some of the mycotoxins. So you want to have a good idea of, uh, you know, what you're turning the birds out there because turkeys are very sensitive to that and you can have some serious health issues. 
and that would, would have been a consideration this last fall in, in Illinois. Okay, so we're going to, we got the birds, uh, we've managed the birds in the, uh, I'll talk a little bit on the nutrition side in a minute, but we've got them out of the brooder, you know, they're, they're going outside either, either in a mobile pen or day ranging, and um, so they're usually feathered about six to eight weeks of age, uh, but just because they're feathered doesn't mean that they're, you know, tough yet. Um, these birds are still very susceptible to, to bad weather, so they need somewhere that they can get in out of, out of the wind, out of rain, and, and just poor weather conditions, okay? Um, so if you have to move the birds, or not if you have to. When you move the birds from the brooder out to a pasture situation, uh, do it early in the day. Uh, the reason for that is they're probably going to be relatively calm and it's going to be cooler. You know, for most of the time we're growing these, it's going to be cooler. Um, hopefully the weather is good and make sure that they know you introduce them to where the water is and, and, and the feed and, and the roosting areas if you have roosting areas for those. And uh, a lot of times, uh, what growers will do is they'll, they'll kind of transition. Uh, they'll move to pasture, but they'll keep the same equipment and strategy for feeding and watering for about a week. So that's just one thing that the bird doesn't have to relearn. Okay, uh, and I have on the bottom there that repetition is the key. Uh, turkeys are like any other animals that, you know, if they get used to you feeding at a certain time of the day in a certain manner and they know where everything is at, uh, that's the key to, uh, to, to making that transition work very well, okay? Uh, pens and pasture, okay? Uh, day range system, uh, like I indicated earlier, is basically a system where you're going to provide uh, basically protection in the evening uh, for these birds where they can roost and you can lock them up and keep them away from predators. Uh, but they will be turned out in the day in the pasture. And um, so that's a day range system. Uh, daily move pens are very popular, uh, at least with the growers that I, I work with. Uh, and daily move pens are, are basically, you know, the pens where the birds are, are a certain number of birds based on the square footage that, that this, they need are kept in a pen that you move every day to fresh pasture. And, and, and like I said, every day is the key. So every day they're going to fresh green uh, pasture. And they're very, very popular. Very little predation with those uh, uh, daily move pens. And um, I think what you'll find is once you find a type of structure that works for you, you know, is easy to move, easy to manage with feeders and all that, uh, you really like that system. I have just as many growers that like the day range system, and that's going to be a, a completely uh, individual decision for you, okay? Um, uh, and that decision, like I have on the screen here, will be based on, you know, what resources, including your time, you know, that you have. Sometimes, uh, you know, if you have a day range system and you're in a hurry and you need to get the birds back in, they don't always cooperate. I think the growers online here that have raised them before might might agree with me on that. Uh, so if that's the case of where you only have a certain amount of time each day to do some chores, maybe a daily move pin, you know, would work better for you. But there's no right or wrong there. And I wish I could spend more time on some of the the uh, the equipment uh, side of this conversation, but we got a lot to get through here today. Maybe we'll do another one of these on equipment. Okay, um, pasture, clean pasture is essential. This is the same if you've raised broilers too, uh, the flock health. Um, and basically what you want to do is, and you'll hear recommendations from one to two years, you don't want to pasture the same area, you know, um, with with poultry, you know, you want to give it a year rest, others say two years, you know, and that'll be based a lot on, you know, what livestock you have on that farm and what your history is with, with poultry on that farm. So as you're setting up your pasture rotations and you're planning for this, you know, a minimum of a year or two would be good that you could rotate those pastures before you put birds back in there. Now, you know, the advantage to that is, um, these, these turkeys um, are going to create a lot of, of very, you know, nutrient-dense dense manure. And, you know, if, if you can, you know, be able to utilize that in terms of renovating your pasture. Or I have some growers that actually come in every couple of years and they'll do a commercial, uh, like a corn crop, you know, in there. And uh, that works very well, too. Okay. Uh, I often get questions about, you know, what is the best pasture to pasture types to use, and uh, as I have here, you know, alfalfa, clover, the grasses uh, work very well. Uh, 
anything that is, is very fine bladed. So orchard grass is a great one. They really like that. Uh, you don't want to use fescue uh, out there, but um, when you renovate your pastures, you should probably think about, you know, the alfalfa and the clovers and, and, and orchard grass certainly in that mixture, okay? Um, wing clipping, uh, this would only um, apply basically to, to people that are in a day range system and, you know, I have some growers that don't do this at all. Um, but you got to remember, if you're growing a standard bred, you know, turkey, like I uh, talked about before, one of the heritage breeds, they're good flyers. You know, the, the broad-breasted ones don't fly much at all, you know. So if you're going to have them in a day range system uh, uh, later on in the, in the production cycle, you may need to, uh, um, you know, clip the uh, primary wing feathers on that and uh, to keep them from flying off because you, you could potentially uh, uh, lose those birds by them flying off and chances are if they fly off a predator is going to get them so and you only need to clip one wing I've got a picture of this uh, in a minute um, and uh, once the toms get heavy you know they they usually don't fly anyway they're just they're just too heavy here's a here's a picture of basically um, you can, if you have any experienced growers around, ask them to show you how, but you basically, you know, these are the primary flight wings out here. You basically just kind of clip the, the tips of those. You don't take very much at all, uh, but that what that does is it creates an imbalance and then they can't fly off. So in terms of their safety, you know, that's something you want to consider. Although, like I said, there's some growers I have that, that get along fine without you know, doing that. One thing you really will want to consider if you're not going to clip uh, those wings is make sure that you have plenty of roosts available for those birds because if you have the, if you don't have anywhere for them to, to roost within your pen or the pasture, what they're wanting to do is fly out of wherever you have them to a tree or something like that to roost. So provide that right there for them and, and maybe that will address any of your birds that want to fly off. Okay. Um, mortality. Um, mortality is a little different than turkeys or than chickens. Um, you know, it, it can be upwards of you know 15 to 25 percent. I have growers that that it consistently achieve 90 percent. You know, and that's something you want to shoot for is that 90 percent level because you you've got a lot of really intensive costs here. Um, uh, a, a big difference, you know, in terms of this mortality is think about this. I, I was just looking this morning at the price of some poults and and basically what I was finding was the the the, the cheapest if if you will, I hate to use that term, was a nine-dollar-day-old uh, uh, poult being mailed out. So, you know, the first day they come on your farm, you've got nine dollars in them right there. So mortality is very huge. That's why I mentioned earlier about spending all that time that you can in the, uh, you know, the, with the brooder with them. But shoot for a ninety percent survival rate. Okay. And mortality uh, will vary based on the type of bird you're feeding and the environment and some of the other issues that you're you're um, you have issues with. Uh, one thing I would um, mention to the new growers, uh, if you've never done this before, is find a veterinarian in your area that has some poultry expertise or poultry interest um, and get to know them before you get birds because um, there's not a lot of poultry uh, veterinarians out there. So if you, you know, if you can develop a relationship with some of them and they know you're you're going to, you know, be raising these birds. Maybe they'll be able to, you know, do a little uh, homework on their own and be able to help you out when you have some situations that will arise. And believe me, you will have, you will have situations. Okay. On the mortality, the last thing I note there is just, you know, if you have a death, figure out why uh, so that you can address it quickly. Because a lot of times. If it's a, a disease or something, you need to have that disease identified quickly so you can treat the rest of the flock. Um, illness, um, pretty straightforward. You know, uh, as you become better at your animal husbandry or, or uh, the ones that have been growing before, you can tell a healthy chick or a healthy uh, turkey by the way they act. You know, they don't have watery eyes. There's no discharge. Um, when you go in there or to the pen, you know, they're talking to you. They're walking around. If you walked out to the pasture and you had 50 turkeys in there and there was one in a corner, you know that that's an odd behavior and you want to check that one out, okay? 
um, and uh, how much they're eating. Uh, the smaller number of birds that a lot of my growers that I work with have, they have a really good idea, a real good handle on what the uh, appetite and how much feed consumption is going on with those birds. Um, so that's something to consider. And that's something you acquire as you get better at this. Uh, predation protection. This is very important with, with all poultry. Um, and just, you know, you want to make sure that in, in your pasture system or, you know, whatever system you're using, make sure that it's in an area where things can't hide. Cats can't hide. Raccoons can't hide. Uh, a lot of people are using uh, guard dogs and they train the guard dogs to uh, uh, work with their, in their poultry pastures and works very, very well. Um, the key here, you know, with all, all poultry is you want to confine them at night and, and, and put them up, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day so you can put them in a predator proof something and uh, maintain that level of safety for them. Just a real quick note, I don't have time to go over it, but when you have uh, birds that are killed by different types of predators, uh, each one of these predators shown here will eat uh, the, the prey, which is your bird, differently. So based on how that carcass has been eaten and what's left will tell you what the predator is. And uh, so um, that's an important thing to consider. I wish I could spend more time on that. Handling and transport. Um, just a couple of things. You'll never never catch a turkey by catching its wings uh, or, or uh, by one leg. Basically what you want to do is kind of crowd them into a smaller area where you can kind of just give them a bear hug, if you will. And uh, because anytime you grab them just by one leg or one wing, you, the potential to, for injury to them is very important. Um, transport crates. If you're new to, to uh, raising turkeys, uh, and I'm going to ask my growers on here if they agree or disagree with me in a minute. If you're new to turkeys, um, the transport crates you have for your broilers uh, are not going to work for your turkeys. They're just they're too small. And what you'll find also is you can't get many mature uh, birds in a standard you know crate. So you need to make sure that you're either building uh, the proper size crates to handle turkeys or uh, you're purchasing them. Um, another consideration that I really didn't appreciate the first time I grew turkeys was that um, I didn't have enough of these and, and I very quickly built more of them uh, for the simple fact like I mentioned that it takes a lot of the transport cages you know to, to move these birds um, there, this isn't a real good screen but what I what I want to get across with this screen is, is a couple of things. There's a lot of published materials out there about uh, nutrient requirements of, of turkeys, and and you can search any of the any of the university sites will give you uh, the nutrient profiles for a feeding regimen for for turkey. So I, I I don't have one specific one I give to you. The the key point to take home from this is that. Um, their nutrient requirements will vary by not only the type of bird that you're feeding, you know, male or female, but also, you know, the, the, the breed that you're feeding and then their age. Uh, you know, we don't need to be feeding a, a turkey that's, you know, uh, a male turkey that's 20, 20 age, uh, weeks of, old, of age, the same as we're feeding those, um, those young poults. And the reason that's so important is you're going to go through a lot of feed with these animals, so you want to make sure you're accomplishing several things. They're getting no more, no less than the daily nutrient requirements they require, and you're feeding them specifically from a you know cost standpoint. Uh, so that's very important. So um, if we had more time, we'd spend a lot more time on nutrition. The only other thing I want to mention on nutrition that's kind of a, a critical thing is really take some time and consider if you have the time, the knowledge, and the resources and equipment to manage your own feed system. Uh, so if, if you don't know a lot about nutrition, and there's a lot to it, from particle size to amino acid profiles of the feed and, and feedstuffs, and, and if you don't feel comfortable with a lot of this, really consider these commercial feeds, because what they're going to do is they're very specifically formulated. And what I mean by an amino acid profile is that Turkeys have different requirements than the chickens, especially on the protein side, and the distribution or the proportion of different types of proteins in there need to be in the correct amount or else you won't get the productivity you need. 
So, you know, taking all that into consideration, really consider, you know, using these commercial feeds. If you're comfortable with it and you have training and knowledge and equipment, by all means, you know, we can show you a nutrient profile and you can mix it. But just think very carefully about feed before you do that. I get this question all the time. How much will they eat? And it's a very, very general answer I'm giving you, okay? Um, so some of these, you know, birds you might have, you know, on the farm up to six months. And during that time, you know, a big heavy tom could eat, you know, almost 100 pounds and hens, you know, upwards of 60. So that's a huge difference when you compare it to what you're used to with broiler chickens. They eat a lot of feed, okay? Here's another a picture of an outside pen. Uh, probably a lot of you will recognize. These are commonly called Salatin pens. Uh, Joel Salatin, uh, who probably most of you online here have heard the name before, kind of pioneered this this pen type. Uh, just another example of a an outside uh, daily move pen for turkeys. Uh, that's that's very effective. I, I have growers myself that I work with that do a really good job with them. Uh, so any structure that you use for chickens outside in terms of a daily move pen are gonna is gonna work for turkeys generally. It's just you have to make sure that you have the right amount of birds in there. You certainly can't put as many uh, turkeys in there as chickens. Okay. Um, these. Uh, what I have here are some different types of uh, shelter, and um, um, this is another one that's very easy to Google and find. A lot of these structures were, were put together, or these plans were put together in, in the 20s through the 40s for turkeys because uh, there were a lot of structures that farmers were building on farms, and if you, uh, if you, if you uh, look for any of these, you know, turkey range shelters, uh, these are the plans that are going to pop up uh, for you on there. There's not really a standard type of a structure out there, but uh, my point with this slide is there are a lot of plans out there from universities all across the country uh, that did work in this area in the early part of the last uh, century. Um, I like this picture here. Um, I had it, uh, someone say that uh, when we were talking about turkeys that they're curiously cautious. Um, if that door was open there, those turkeys would walk right in that door, and probably some of our growers online have had that uh, experience happen. Um, uh, uh, so they're, they're just cautious. That's what they're going to do during the day. So uh, you'll find very quickly where your fencing and your structures aren't working well because they'll find the, uh, the uh, holes and, and all of that with your, uh, with your production system. Stocking density, I just want to quickly talk about. Um, there, there's a real general, you know, I have here 50 to 125 birds per acre, but that is so based on your individual situation and what what type of forages and, and the quality of the forage that you have out there on your farm. So, you know, that is very, very general, that 50 to 125 birds. The better your quality of your pasture, you know, uh, you might be able to run, run, run more out there, but um, it's really based on the type of pasture that you have, okay? And um, remember that you're going to rotate those pastures. You don't want to have those birds out there um, continually, you know, raising new birds on where you were just uh, raising the others, okay? So, here, you know, here's another recommendation on range-fed turkeys, 30 square foot per bird. There's 145 is what this, uh, this recommendation is. Um, but this will just kind of give you, you an idea. Remember when I was talking earlier about the... Uh, you can minimize aggression and fighting and, and some health issues if you make sure that you have enough space. What what this is showing here is, um, um, especially on feeders and drinkers, you can see from zero to six weeks of age, if you provide one linear inch, you know, per poult, um, zero to six, there's not going to be fighting for wa uh, for feed and that. If you provide half an inch, they're not going to fight for water. And that progressively increases up to, you know, past 14 weeks of age. Make sure you have three inches, you know, uh, linear inches per bird at the feeder. That way they can get right up to the feeder and not fight. And then um, uh, drinker space is uh, uh, tripled there also, you know, 1.5 inches there. You never want them fighting for water or, or feed. Uh, that's a very important thing. Uh, it'll just cause you troubles and they won't uh, be as productive as before. Uh, here's kind of a key point for today also is don't mix turkeys and, and chickens because of disease transmission. Um, chickens carry diseases that turkeys can get and uh, it's just not a good idea. I, I don't have time to go into a lot of it and I'm not a veterinarian, but um, 
if you want to save yourself a lot of a lot of uh, trouble later on, don't mix the birds. Um, this screen, what I wanted to put up there was just to kind of remind. Don't don't worry so much about um, um, writing down the uh, um, the website. But what I wanted to mention here with this site is coming back to the processing side. Um, there are guidelines for um, you know on-farm poultry processing, and, and turkeys would certainly fall under those. Um, maybe we can do a, a session actually on that whole topic sometime. Um, but do consider you know part of um, um, a huge part of this. You know I mentioned when we first started here, processing is a big big deal with this, and it's not that it's you know. Uh, that much more difficult physically, you know, it is. But you have to have the right equipment, what have you. And I, I just don't want to. I've seen a few growers I've worked with that have done exceptionally well with everything, and then they got to a point where they had birds ready to slaughter, uh, and they had nowhere to go with them, and it was just a real headache. So before you get started in any of this, whether you're going to process on farm or you're going to have it commercially done at an inspected facility. Um, Consider, you know, what you're going to do with with the processing side of that before you even order a chick. That would be that would be very important. Wow, I just I got ahead of myself. I was thinking that was a good point, and there it is. I, I won't I won't go over a lot of those today. You'll find also uh, with in terms of turkeys. Uh, some of the processors may not be really used to working with turkeys, so they might need to do some different scheduling to get you in to do the birds, because uh, they won't be able to do as many birds in a day, in, uh, turkeys in a day as chickens. Um, and there's not a lot of them out there that do small, uh, small batch processing, so so do some homework there, and uh, because you might have to drive a really long way to do that. Uh, I might have mentioned it in the next one. Yeah, right here. Um, if you do process on farm and you've got your own uh, equipment that you're using, for instance, with uh, your chickens, um, one of the things you're going to find is you have to have the larger kill cones because the ones that you use for your large broilers uh, just aren't going to work um, for these turkeys. There's, there's a, they're big birds, you know, and they won't even fit in the cones. Uh, your scalder won't ho hold nearly as much, you know, and that's fine. It just takes a little longer. Usually, only one bird at a time in, in the scalder. And uh, there's more there's more hand labor uh, when you do turkeys because the feathers don't come off completely as easily as they do with the broilers. So that would be a, a difference um, uh, compared to chickens. So a take home message there: it's more involved. You know, it's not terrible. It's just it's just different. It's more more involved. Okay. And here's the other thing um, with uh, uh, processing and selling these birds, um, especially like some of the, the heritage breeds. You know, we talked about they're going to look different than the than the broad-breasted birds that we see commercially. You know, if we went into any random store and, and picked up at at uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving, these birds are going to look a lot different. Okay, because they are different birds. They have a different type of growth pattern and carcass. And so, instance, for instance, since they are good at foraging. They'll have a longer leg, you know, and their keel is longer. So their breast. Remember that they're naturally mating. One of the reasons that the the, the commercial turkeys that we have now can't mate is because they've bred to ha been bred to have so much uh, breast meat that they physically can't do that. Well, these heritage breeds that I'm talking about, they don't have that problem. So they're going to look different when you cook them. And uh, the you know the growers I work with usually provide you know recipes and things like that for the bird. For the producer or the people that are buying their birds, to help them know that you know these things are going to be there's nothing wrong with the bird. It's just a different type of bird. I'm going to stay on here and answer as many of the the very broad topic questions as I can. Um, so I I can stay on for about another half hour or so for whoever wants to stay on. If you want to stay on through the question and answers, if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box, and I'm going to go through as many of those as I can. With that, if you need to leave, feel free to. If if not, throw some questions out here, and we're going to try and, and work through those. Okay. Otherwise, thank you very much for being on today, and I hope you can attend the rest of the sessions. Okay. Um, there, right now in Illinois, there's a question out there about processing in Illinois. Right now, there's only one federally inspected processing uh, facility in Illinois, and that's in Arthur. 
uh, right now. I, I I understand that there are some others that are being considered, so you know that's a, that's something to think about too. And I think as more people begin producing these types of birds, we'll get more facilities. Uh, um, there's a actually the on the the uh, the licensing and that that's a very there's a lot to that, uh, Jacob. And what I'll do is you just need to, um, depending on the number of birds you're going to uh, raise, uh, that dictates what what um, uh, basically the the legal side of it or the licensing side of it that you deal with. There's a certain number, you know, that you can be uh, under and still sell from the farm, but it's it's more complicated than that because you can only sell to certain entities off of the farm. So actually. What I'm going to do there is I'm going to write this one down because I get this question so much, I think we might put together even another webinar on that topic. So we'll do that. Okay. Um, okay, uh, here's a good one. Is electric fencing recommended? Uh, yeah. Um, you want to make sure that, that uh, the, net, the it's called poultry electric poultry netting that you use out there in those, those day range systems. And um, uh, you want to make sure that's electrified. And a lot of the suppliers, you can buy a, a charging unit that's appropriate and made specifically for their netting. So it is electric. And most people don't put any netting over their uh, outside runs. Um, um, now, if you have trouble, you know, with some of the avian predators, you know, eagles, hawks, things like that, you may need to do something. But I don't have a single grower that has anything over their outside run. Um, so just, you know, if you do lose some birds out there, like I said, pay attention to kind of how they're being killed and that will tell you what predator is getting to them. Okay. Um, there's a good one on predator control, uh, talking about the laser lights. Um, the, um, there's not a lot of research on this, but a lot of the growers that I use do use the little uh, laser lights and basically what that is is you can buy uh, little laser, they're like flashlights that you attach to the pins and what have you, and, and some of them flash, some of them do other things, but they distract the predators. What you'll find is over time, the predators get used to that, so you have to mix it up or they'll get used to that. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, rotating pastures, what I mean by that is let's say you have, um, you have a five-month period where you run your whole batch of birds through, you don't want to come back on that same area for at least another, a minimum of a year and some recommend two. So you wouldn't want to just turn your pins around and go back the other way. You want to stay off of that area for at least a year. Okay. Uh, predator control, um, goats don't have any experience there. Um, the 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 poultry producers that I have are usually using combinations of some of these things like the lights and um, you know making sure that uh, there's not a, the, a lot of roosting areas for these predators around the pastures that they're working in uh, and um, um, oh, there's, oh the dogs the the guard dogs okay. Uh, daily move pins, yeah, those birds uh, stay out there in those daily move pins uh, for their full life. Uh, so you just move them, you know, um, like for instance the pins I have, their, their size are 10 by 8, so I move them ahead 10 feet every day and they stay in there all the time. If you had uh, what's called a day range system, what you would do is you'd move that pin, open it up and let them out and then put them back out or back in the pen at night, okay. Um, some questions on uh, uh, selling birds. Um, I, I would have to have, you know, real general, general, you know, um, the prices that you're going to get for birds are going to depend on where you're selling them. And m most of the growers, if not all of the growers I work with, are selling uh, in a specific market. Usually it's a l larger urban market. Uh, and those birds would sell much differently in a higher price probably than what we, you know, might find in other parts of the state. Um, you know, there's some, there's people selling them from anywhere from two to, two to four pounds, you know, like that. Um, uh, a lot of them are selling on a per bird basis. That just seems easier to them, for them to do that. So, uh, and the, so the return on investment, 
there's not even a general. It's so specific to how you're raising them and what you're doing with equipment and feed and and, and make sure this is the key thing too. Um, when I work with people, make sure when you're doing your budgeting with this that make sure you put in there your labor costs because you're not doing this for free. And what I'd suggest to you is when you're doing that, you know, you need to be paying yourself, uh, you know, a fair living wage. So, you know, you need to be putting in there like $20 an hour for your labor and then keep track of the time that you spend, uh, you know, working with those birds because, you know, if, if you think you're making money with it and you've never put your labor in there, you know, you've got to figure that. Otherwise, you're just working you're working to break even, and that's not going to be a sustainable system. Um, for yeah, on the uh, the the processing regulations, um, um, basically you can type in and look at the Illinois Department of of Agriculture, or you can uh, type in your search engine um, uh, poultry exemption, uh, poultry processing exemption, and that'll bring up a lot of the federal. Uh, type regulations uh, that exist out there. I think what I'm going to do is offer, um, we will work on putting together a session on that to kind of help people out because that does get really confusing. Okay. Oh, someone's trying to get me on a question. Uh, is, is organic feed uh, worth it? I'm smiling uh, on that one. Um, there's no way for me to answer that. If you have clients that that is a value of theirs and they are willing to pay you for going to the effort of uh, that type of production system, then yes, it is worth it. Uh, but it all depends on the end of, of what the people that you're selling to are, are going to see as, as, you know, value to them and, and, and you can utilize that. So, you know, the biggest thing that I can say, and I have my... I have my extension educator and my producer hat on now is is feed is um, you know really really make sure that that you're comfortable in managing that feed and and feed according you know from a from an actual production standpoint you know feed whatever is the 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 easiest most effective feed for you to do you know if it's commercial or if you can work out something with a another person that's raising some some animals and you can mix feed together and then on the other side of that make sure that anything that you do with feed it's got to be nutritionally correct but if it's something that's very very expensive uh, you know you've got to make that money up on the other end and the consumer has to be willing to pay for you to do that or don't do it okay Um, I have growers um, that sell uh, to a lot of different places. Um, I have ones, uh, and I've talked to a lot of growers in, in different states, you know, that have done this too, and I think what you'll find is people will, it depends on how they want to market. Um, if they have uh, a situation, for instance, you may have a scenario where someone's working off farm and they just want to market this these birds one time. They get them processed. They can make one delivery. That works for them. There's others that you know would just sell um, you know direct from the farm. Um, I'm trying to think if any that I'm working with are doing farmers markets or not. I don't think that's a big one. Um, I uh, have a grower that is. Um, selling turkeys as part of their CSA and that's been just hugely popular okay so you you know you look into where whatever your market potential market is and that'll vary a lot too boy you, uh, there's a diversity in where people are marketing around the state you know if you're if you're close to a larger metropolitan area you know find out if there's a way that you can get in there to market uh, uh, to, to clientele in there but a marketing strategy for, you know, Chicago is going to be different than one in, you know, Galesburg where I'm at or, or you know, somewhere in southern Illinois maybe, okay? Um, I had one question about the pin that I use, and uh, the pins that I use actually are, uh, they're, cattle, they're made with cattle panel pins, and they're commonly called hoop pins, where, um, you basically bend over in a loop two uh, full-size cattle panels, and so uh, I like them because I can walk in them. I don't have to stoop over 
and bend over to do any work and all of the feeders and waters are, are hung from the ceiling on a chain. So when I move those pins every day, the feed, the water, everything slides right with me. So they're, you know, they're, they're six and a half feet tall, I think, is, is what they are. So, okay, any, any other questions? I'm going to try and get to all the others, you know, once we, as I said earlier, but is there any other real pressing questions here? Uh, hope everybody's looking forward to the rest of the series. I uh, appreciate your uh, participation today and uh, looking forward to, to seeing or hearing more from all of you. And uh, thanks very much for participating in today's uh, workshop. And uh, we'll be talking with you real soon. So everybody have a great day. Thank you.